We open our Bibles to the book of First Thessalonians and we'll read uh, chapter 2. First Thessalonians chapter 2 and we'll be reading from verse 1 up to verse 9. And if you found your place, I will ask you to stand in honoring the reading of the Word of God. And it reads, For yourselves, brethren, know our entrance in unto you, that it was not in vain, but even after that we had suffered before, and were shamely, shamefully entreated, as you know, at Philippi, we were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. For our exhortation was not of deceit, nor of uncleanness, nor in guile, but as we were allowed of God to put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God, which trieth our hearts. For neither at any time used we flattering words, as you know, nor a cloak of covetousness. God is witness. Nor of men sought we glory, neither of you, nor yet of others when we might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherishes her children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls. Verse 9. For you remember, brethren, our labor and travail, for laboring night and day, because we would not be chargeable unto any of you. We preached unto you the gospel of God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we bow down before you this evening. Just after reading your word, Lord, we ask that you open our hearts, open our eyes, Lord, to know the truth and to listen to your word, Lord. I pray that everyone that is here and those who will be watching on, on YouTube, I pray, Lord, that you prepare, you prepare them for your word, that your word may dwell in the people's hearts, Lord, and not only stay in their hearts, but, Lord, you help us to meditate your word day and night and to search your scriptures, O oh Lord, to direct our ways. And as I am about to preach now, Lord, I ask for the Holy Spirit to guide me, Lord, not to speak my own opinion, but to speak the truth of your word, O oh Lord. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So the title of uh, the message tonight, this evening, is Sound the Trumpet for Christ. Sound the Trumpet for Christ. Why am I saying, or why did I give this title? The book of Thessalonians, uh, before I go any further, I just want to give you the background of uh, what happened, what motivated Apostle Paul to uh, write this letter to the church at Thessalonica. So Apostle Paul is the author. He was writing to the church at Thessalonica. So the church was started by Paul during his second uh, missionary journey. Because you remember, after Paul got saved, he started going out to city by city, preaching the word of God. Because he saw God on his way to Damascus, and then he repented from, uh, from sin, and now he became the follower of Christ. So he started the church at Corinth. Uh, we will get this at Acts 17, verse 1. It says, Now when they had passed through to Amphipolis and Apoll Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica. So it was Paul and his uh, associates. I think this was with Silas. So from uh, Philippi, we'll get, we'll get where they were first. They were at Philippi, Philippi where they got imprisoned. And they got beaten. Beaten for what? for speaking the truth, for speaking the word of God to the people in Philippi. Because those people now, they were uh, jealous of the word. Because remember, 
back in the day, people held on to their traditions. They held on to worshiping idols. They held on to their cultures. So Paul came through and preached the word of God. So the, the, the Greek and the Jewish people were not happy. So they arrested Paul and Silas. We know what happened. I'm not going to go to that story. That's a story for another day because my message today in the, is in the book of uh, Thessalonians. Thessalonians. So I'm just giving you a background before we dive in to chapter 2, just so we can understand you know, wh what motivated Paul to write this letter. So he remained in Thessalonica for three weeks. So he preached there for three weeks in the synagogues. And his preaching resulted in many Gentiles and the people at Thessalonica and some Jews they got saved. And that's the power of the gospel of God. I mean, it's not preached in vain. Whenever the word of God is preached, God is touching people's hearts. And so this is what happened in uh, Thessalonica. They preached for three weeks, and then God opened the hearts of the people. The Holy Spirit touched their hearts, then they accepted the word. And Paul took advantage. You know, the synagogues is a place where the, the, the Jews used to meet and, and uh, discuss their traditional things, you know, talk about uh, what they believe in. So that's where people used to gather. So that's a good opportunity. We always look for where people are gathering so we can give them the word. You know, we're giving at least uh, a number of people. They get to hear the gospel message. And this is the advantage that Paul took. But if it was myself, I know, I, I, I look back and, and, and and be like Paul, he was fresh from beatings. You know, they were flogged all, you know, they had wounds. But what would you have done? Would you still go and preach the word for, of which you were beaten for? You know, you were arrested for preaching the word. But he still continues after from prison, he still goes to the next city to preach. I mean, that's, that's amazing. You know, as, 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 I don't think we would have carried on if, you know, but I know that it's the gospel, it's the power of the gospel that kept Apostle Paul strong. Even if he was, the body was still painful, but he moved on to preach the word of God. And as a result, people got saved. And that's the, 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 the most important thing. People come to know Christ. But there was a problem because the other unbelieving Jews, they were not happy because they've been teaching their people how to worship idols and all that. So if someone comes now and teach something different from what we know, obviously we won't be happy about it because you, are, you will say you are leading our people astray. And this is what uh, was happening there in uh, Thessalonica. They were like, no, this man, Paul, he's come here to turn our world upside down, which means he came here to feed our people a different doctrine of which we do not believe in. So they got jealous, and they were looking for Paul. He was staying by the house of Jason. We read, you will find this in Acts chapter, I think it's Acts 17, that's where they, when they were moving from town to town, they needed a place to, you know, to sleep. So Jason opened his doors for, for, for the missionaries to, to stay with him, and then so that they can carry on doing the work of the Lord. So the, pe the Jews that were not saved, those unbelieving, they went to the house of Jason looking for Paul, you know, because they were like, no, he must go. Oh, we, we need to arrest him. But then they did not know that Paul has already left in the middle of the night to another city to preach the word. Not to run away, but he went to preach at another city. But they discredited him because they said, oh, so he left. So he's a self-saving coward. Why did he leave? We wanted him here to account for the, the, the doctrine that he's putting in our people. But then Paul did not leave because he was a coward. He left to go to another city because from Thessalonica, Paul has traveled to Berea. He went from Berea to Athens. From Athens, he went to, to Corinth. And uh, 
he was faithful to the Lord. So after spending time in Thessalonica, so he left, but Timothy, he went back after some time to the church that was started at Thessalonica. Why did he go there? He went there to, because remember they only stayed for, for three weeks. You know, they, they started preaching the word, people got saved. You must understand when you just got saved, you need more of the soft, you know, soft doctrines. I mean, soft words so that you can understand the Bible and then gradually you will understand now, uh, you will go in depth of studying the word. So Timothy went back to continue in, in the mission while Paul also gets to other cities. So when Timothy was there at Thessalonica, because he saw how the church was doing, the church was doing great. People who just got saved were serving the Lord faithfully. So he, he saw it fit that he writes a, a, a report to Paul to say, Paul, the church that you started, they are doing great. The people are holding on to the truth of the gospel. And this motivated Paul to write this letter to encourage them, to encourage them to continue in their faith. So that's why he wrote the book of uh, Thessalonians. So I just wanted to give us a, a background or a sort of introduction before we, we, we get into chapter 2. And I think this, uh, this example of this church of Thessalonica is, is a good example for us to follow while we're waiting for our Lord Jesus Christ to come for his people because there's a lot that we, we, can, we can learn from this church. You know. So let us first uh, look at why they were progressing well in their faith because we need to learn we are learning we need to follow the right leadership because they followed the right leadership the godly leadership of paul and for us we've got the scriptures we follow from the good uh, churches of god so number one they served god faithfully we found this if you just across the page on first thessalonians chapter 1 verse 3 it says remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and the Father. They had the right foundation, which is they trusted in God. That's the right foundation. We don't trust on anything else but in God. So they had the right, right foundation and they had the right motive. If you check on verse 3, it says they were working in love. Working in love meaning we've received the word and now we pass it on because we love our families, we love the people around us, so we will share with them the word of God. They were sounding the word of God. That's why I chose this sound the trumpet because Paul was teaching them that Christ can come at any moment. It's, his, his coming is imminent, so which means at any given time Christ can come for his people. So while we're waiting for Christ, because we know that Christ will come with a shout of a trumpet and all that. So while we're waiting for the trumpet of Christ, we must sound the trumpet for Christ. So that's, that's why I chose this title. It goes back to the church at Thessalonica. They were sounding the trumpet for Christ while waiting for the trumpet of Christ. And that's what we should be doing as well. I know IBC is a church that, you know, we, 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 we love to see souls get saved. And that's one thing I've learned from the, the churches around. I've been around to certain churches in Pretoria before I found the right church, which is IBC, the Bible believing and the Bible teaching church. So I've, I've came to realize that we love the Lord and we love to see souls get saved. And that's the will of God for everyone. God does not want any to perish, but all should come to the knowledge of Christ. So they had the right motive, and they also persevered in suffering because their hope was in our Lord Jesus Christ. That kept them going. They knew that even though we can suffer for Christ, we look up and our hope is built on nothing else, but on Christ the solid rock we stand. Number two, they followed godly leadership. We find this in verse 6. It says, and he became followers of us. This is Paul. 
saying, You became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy. So they followed the apostle of God, suffered for the word of God, and rejoiced in the spirit. And then they sounded the word, which means they continued in their faith, sharing the word of God. Now, let's go now and look at chapter 2. This is where our message will come from. So Paul wrote here in chapter 2 in a personal manner, but this really was not a personal issue. He did not have a personal issue, but he was touched when he wrote this uh, letter to the church because of the report that he got from Timothy. So he wrote in that personal manner, because he knew that it mattered for the sake of the gospel, because he must understand there was opposition. And imagine if you just shared the gospel to someone, they just got saved. They are still children, or they're still young in, in, in Christianity. And you having this mind, what if they go back to serving idols? So this report that he got, that they stood and they're standing firm in the faith, encouraged him to even write so that he can encourage them further not to step back. So there were people who uh, discredited him. So he had to answer some of those questions in this letter for the people who were like, no, he ran away, he's a coward, he's a self-saving coward. So he had to also respond to, to, to those kind of uh, of allegations. So in chapter 2, he reminds the church of the Thessalonica of those circumstances that he was involved in when he was starting the church. So if we read on verse 1, it says, For yourselves, brethren, he's talking to the Christians at the church, for yourselves, brethren, know our entrance in unto you that it was not in vain. So Paul in verse 1 shows the power of this gospel, shows the power of the word of God by confirming to the Christians in Thessalonica that his visit to them was for a great cause because they received the word of God. It was not in vain. He didn't go there for nothing. He went there to preach the word and they received the word of God with much affliction and were able to turn from idols to serve the living God. Turning means completely turning to a different direction. They were worshipping idols, but then they turned, the Bible says, from saving idols to serve the living God. And this is the problem that we have in, in, in our country, uh, especially where I come from, in, in the rurals, back in Limpopo. We have people who are still worshipping uh, the so-called, they call them ancestors. They are rooted in that tradition. And they, they, they are missionaries down there uh, who preach the word of God. But the problem that we have is that people do not want to turn completely from saving uh, the ancestors and saving God. Yes, they accept the word. Yes, they believe that there is God. But they just can't trust God enough. They can't trust God alone to save them. They can't trust God alone to, to you know, direct their paths. They want to hold the, the, the ancestors and God in parallel. And I'm sorry, but that's, they're still in darkness. They, they are still in darkness. And you still find people who are religious, especially I've noted that the celebrities in South Africa are motivating the, the influence actually of this because of they are prospering in the worldly things. So when they achieve those things, they tend to say, I thank God and my ancestors. And this gives people a way to say, oh, so God alone cannot, you know, cannot let me achieve certain things. So I need my ancestors as well. I need to thank them. I need to recognize them. And that's wrong. The Bible says, there's only one way to heaven. There's only one mediator, which is Christ. There's, we do not go to, to God through our ancestors. They're dead. At least we recognize that they're dead. They were our fathers, our grandfathers, they're dead. They cannot do anything for us. But God rose from the dead. He conquered death, and we believe in him. God only. Christ says, 
and John uh, 14 verse 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. So we don't go to the Father by our ancestors. Because I asked a lot of people, I say, why do you say God and your ancestors? They say, Abraham, when people in the Bible, they say, we, we pray to the God of Abraham. We pray to the God of our fathers. So I was like, so your fathers, were they believing in God? They say, no. They were believing in the dead as well. But we believe that our connection, because we are not born of Abraham, our connection is the ancestors to God. I was like, no, ways. it does not work like that. Our connection is Christ. You need to turn completely from saving your ancestors and look at the living God. Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. So if we look at verse 2, it says, But even after that we had suffered before, we were shamefully entreated. We went through the story of uh, when Paul was in prison and all that. But he continued preaching the word of God. Why did he do that? Because it was not about him. It was never about Paul. It was about who sent him, which is God. That's why Paul did not throw the towel, because he was not doing it for him. If he was doing it for him, he would have thrown the towel, I'm telling you. But he was doing it for God, and the power in the gospel kept Paul going. If we, 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 we look at uh, Acts, it tells us about how bold Paul uh, preached the word. Bold means you are speaking something that you are sure of, which is the word. I have a problem with public speaking, but then because I'm speaking the word of God, it's not my word, it's God's word. That gives me the courage to even, you know, stand up in front of people and share the gospel. But without this gospel, there was nothing that I was going to tell you tonight. <laughs> but it's all in this book, which is the word of God. I'm just a vessel that God is using, and the Holy Spirit is working in me to help me deliver the message. So Paul as well, he knew what it was like to speak boldly for the Lord, even in much conflict. So in verse 3, we see that the purity of Paul's message, it makes it apparent that there was no deceit or uncleanness or guile in his ministry. Because in verse 3 it says, For our exhortation was not of deceit. We did not come here as they say that we are coming to deceive you, but we are coming to preach you. We are coming to shine the light to you. We are coming to tell you the good news. Gospel is the good news. It's the good news because someone died for our sins. In our place, we were supposed to die for our own sins, but God died for our sins. And so it is good news to us, but it was not good news to Christ on the cross because he was feeling pain for us to be saved when we believe in him and trust in his gospel. So Paul here is telling them that I did not come to deceive you, but I came to give you the word. You must remember that in that time, there were people or religious people who were, who were competing also, preaching their own type of gospel to the people. And they were sent there as missionaries. They had a missionary mind and sought to spread their faith using uh, the false evangelists and preachers. Most of these missionaries were opportunists who took everything they could from their listeners and then moved on to find someone else to support them. So it was a thing of there are people who are preaching other things. So Paul had to, you know, be separate from those people. He had to find ways to, to, to show that I am coming from the true, true God. I'm not coming here to, you know, talk about myself or using nice ways to win you so that you people can support me. 
I'm not here for that. I'm not here to take from you. I'm here to give you the word of God. And still, we still find such people today. In Pretoria, Pretoria, I think Pretoria is a hub of these people. They come from wherever, claiming to be uh, men of God. But they are not coming here for preaching the word. They use the word, yes, they use the Bible, but they are here. If, if we read Romans 16, verse 18, it says, for they, that, for they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. They want to feed their own stomachs. That's all they care about. They will try to convince you with the scriptures. They will look for scriptures that are talking about tithe, scriptures that are talking about offering. But that offering is not meant to be the help in the church. It's meant for their bellies. And once they are full, what do they do? They move on to the next city to deceive those people. So Paul had that challenge because they were thinking he's one of those people who are coming to feed his own, but he made it clear that I'm not here to take anything from you, but instead I'm here to give you. Verse 4, as we have been approved by God, or as we have been entrusted by God, we serve but as we are allowed of God to put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak not as pleasing men, but God. So Paul here is telling the church that he has been approved by God. And I'm telling you today that if you are a saved Christian, you have, a, you have been approved by God as well to witness to others. You do not need special qualifications to do that. Every saved Christian has he has been entrusted by God with the word. And so we need to also spread the word, sound the trumpet for Christ. So even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who test our hearts. Paul knew his gospel wouldn't always, you know, uh, please men. That's why he's saying that this, I'm doing this to please God. I'm not here to please you. I'm here to please God because he's the one who sent me to come and preach the word to, to you. So if we carry on now and look at verse uh, 6 and 7, we see that Paul's gentle and humble attitude amongst the Thessalonians demonstrates that his motives were pure. I'm not going to read for the sake of time, but if we, we, we look there at verse 6, Paul ministered among Thessalonians he was unconcerned of his personal glory. He did not need fancy introductions or lavish praise. His satisfaction came from his relationship with Jesus. He was satisfied because of the relationship he had with the Lord. He did not need people to praise him. He did not need the praise because he was satisfied by his relationship with Jesus and he wanted us as well to be satisfied. So as we preach the word, we're not doing it to be praised, to say, oh, Brother Shane, Brother Shane is the man of God, is a real man of God. Eh? But Brother Shane is preaching to us so that we can learn and uh, do what the word of God says. He's also sent by God. But it's not so in this world because there's pastors who even have titles, you know, you know, fancy, fancy, uh, they need fancy introductions before they come to preach. You need someone to hype you, you know. They even give them, we know them, they are here. They've got fancy names like Major 1, Major 2, Major 3. Those people are, are here, they need to be praised. That's why they get such titles. Brother Shane, you won't go to a field and use Pastor Shane. You need to have something like, Pastor Shane, the miracle worker, then people will approve you. You, know? you, need, you need to be convincing before you go into the field. This is what they're doing. Because they seek to be praised. You know, they seek to be popular or, or have power over someone. You know, you know I always give illustrations because back where I come from at home, they do crusades. So they will put posters 
you know, in electric poles and all that so we can see. They will say, there's Pastor Shane, the miracle worker coming. That's when you will see that you don't have members in your church. Because the moment that guy comes to the tent, all your members are gone. So that's why I'm saying we need missionaries to go to the rural areas. areas. The people there, they claim to know God. But if someone comes with a sweet tongue, with a sweet message, they're all out of the church going to that person. Why? Because, I mean, it's a poor rural area. It comes promising prosperity. And that's all they care about. But what I know about the word of God is that God, we, we are so blessed as Christians, you know, not with earthly things, but blessings to me, I define it as the joy that is within you that does not depend on any circumstances. You know, you just have this joy. Just by reading God's word, you'll find yourself smiling because God is talking to you and you, you are joyful of that. So we, we, we have seen that Paul ministered because he had an understanding of his identity which is in Christ. So if we move on to, or before we move on, Paul was among the Thessalonians to give something to them which is the, the, the word of God. He did not make any demands. He did not say, I'm preaching to you, you need to give to me because I don't have a job. No, Paul was working as a tent maker so he can meet his basic needs while he's preaching the word of God so that he cannot be a burden to the new church. I'm not saying it's wrong to support uh, missionaries, but then for Paul, because there were other people who were using that tactic to rob people of what, he had to be unique. And, and you know, even though it was right for him to have, to be supported, for that time, he only put it aside to say, I don't need anything from you. I will work so that I can get my basic needs sorted while I preach the word. So it, it, it reminds me of this song that we used to sing in Sunday school. It says, go in my name, and because you believe, others will know that I live, which is God. So freely you have received, freely give. So this is the mentality that Apostle Paul had. He freely gave the word. And again, in verse 7, he was gentle among them. He was gentle like a nursing mother. You know, you don't want anything to happen to your little one. You, you make sure that your, your, your baby is safe. So he was treating the church as little babies because he did not want the other people to corrupt them with, to, with another doctrine. So he shared the word with them as like a mother to the child nursing. It has been said that people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. But Apostle Paul here gave both his care and his knowledge to the church at Thessalonica. That's why they valued him. He had that relationship with that church. Verse 9. For you remember, brethren, our labor and toil. Paul recognized his right. I spoke about this. It's in 1 Corinthians 9.14. But he voluntarily gave up his right to be supported so that he can stay, we can be apart from the missions, the false religions that were there demanding people's support. Verse 10, Paul's behavior and message to the Thessalonians demonstrates that his integrity or his character uh, before God and man. I mean, this is one of, you know, as Christians, our character, how is our character? It is impressive that Paul could freely appeal to his own example. Paul didn't have to say, please don't look at my life. I'm such a bad person, please don't look at my life. But look to Jesus. Paul wanted people to look to Jesus, yes, but he could also tell them to look at his life. Is it the same for me and you? Can we simply say, yes, look into my life, look deep into my life and see any wrongdoing? It's not easy for us because we, you know, we are, we, sometimes we are double, double standard. We come to church as these nice people, and then when we go back home, we switch to this different character that is not pleasing to God. Just because oh, our church members are not watching, God is not watching. But God is watching all the time. And this is what Paul is telling them, that yes, I can freely say, look at my life as well. Yes, I want you to look to Jesus, but you can also look at my life. 
Why did he say that? Because the power of Jesus was real in his life. He was not ashamed. We all know Paul before he got saved, he was sold, and we know what he did to the church of God. But he, he could easily tell people, look at my life, learn something from my life. Is it so to us? I mean, this is a worthy goal for any Christian today, to live a life that declares how devoutly and justly and blamelessly we, have, we behave ourselves among others. This is the kind of life that draws others to follow Jesus for themselves. People need to see Jesus through our lives, how we live outside of church. I mean, if you have friends, they need to know that you are a believer and that they may follow as well. They might, they might want to follow Jesus based on your character. So as Christians, I think it's important that we, we try and do the will of God and then spread the word to the people. In some way in Psalms it says, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. And he delighted in his ways. Though he falls, he shall not be utterly cast down. For the Lord upholded him with his hand. So with, with these uh, few words from the Bible, I just wanted to encourage us, us that let us look to the book of Thessalonians. And the, Paul and the church have set the example for us to follow. And I think God will bless us even more when we do his will. I, thank you.